Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first talk of today. My name is Roy Starkey, and I'm going to be discussing the minerals of the English Midlands. The map on the left shows the area that I've defined as the English Midlands. It's a, a fairly arbitrary term, but certainly people would recognise the bulk of this area as being in the Midlands of the United Kingdom. And I have mineralogical reasons for including all of these counties, and we'll discuss those as we go on through the talk. To give you some idea of the size of the area, it's about 11,600 square miles, perhaps comparable to Massachusetts. And on the right here, I've put the UK and sat it across the, the border between Wyoming and uh, Colorado. And you can see the yellow rectangle representing the study area. So in terms of US geography, it's tiny. However, uh, we have a very interesting and diverse geological situation and a lot of interest in mineral localities. The area um, is home to a number of classic localities, uh, places like Yate for Celestine, Beige Mine for the Matlakite and Hosgenite, um, the Derbyshire Peak District, very famous for first bar and uh, calcite, uh, pink calcite from Shropshire, and all sorts of other interesting occurrences around the area. It's also a place where many famous people and collectors have uh, lived and worked and the specimens uh, from the Midlands are recognised all over the world and if you go into any reasonable mineralogical museum anywhere in the world you're likely to find some specimens from this region. I don't propose to say very much about the geology but just to set the scene we're talking about an area with an ancient basement that goes down to Ordovician, Silurian, Cambrian, Precambrian strata, but it's largely obscured by younger deposits and therefore we only see the basement where it pokes through this uh, younger cover. In the north of the area, uh, in the Derbyshire Dome, uh, we've got Carboniferous Limestone flanked on either side by coal measures rocks and these have been of economic importance. Uh, the coal measures also appear in, in a belt coming down through Staffordshire and into Birmingham and this has been uh, very important for the economic history of the region. Over in the west towards the Welsh border uh, we have older rocks um, appearing at the surface, uh, Silurian, Ordovician, Cambrian, Precambrian and in the south to south east area uh, we have the Jurassic Escarpment which runs for a couple of hundred miles across the country and uh, is of more interest for fossils than it is for minerals. So I think that will do us uh, for a geological overview. Next I would like to just walk you around uh, the area and talk about some of the areas which have produced um, productive economic mineral deposits and we'll start in the north at Audley Edge where we have Bronze Age copper mines. Here we have disseminated copper mineralisation in Triassic sandstones that have been worked extensively and although the minerals are generally not spectacular it is a very interesting deposit. Probably the jewel in the crown for the area is the South Pennine ore field. Uh, this is certainly where most of the mining in the area has been carried on. We're talking pr principally about lead, uh, a little bit of zinc, calcite, fluorite and barite as being the principal mineral products. And coming down to the south of the Peak District um, to the southern margin of Derbyshire, across into Leicestershire and up into Nottinghamshire, there's an extensive area of uh, evaporite deposits which have been worked and are still worked for gypsum and anhydrite for plaster, plasterboard and cement production. In the east of the area uh, there is an arcuate outcrop of Jurassic ironstone which has also been of great economic importance and indeed the steel industry of the area around Corby to the east of Northampton uh, has been a major employer for something like a hundred years. Down in the far southwest, just north of Bristol, the Yate Celestine field uh, is responsible for producing something like 70% of the world's demand for strontium sulfate for a period of about 100 years. And that industry came to an end in the 1980s. And just across the River Severn, in the Forest of Dean, uh, we have limestone, coal measures, and iron ore. And therefore, no surprise that early iron production was centered on that area. And in the uh, middle west area, the West Shropshire ore fields has produced some interesting specimens, perhaps Snail Beach Mine will be somewhere you'll have heard of, Bergen Mine for Pyromorphite, and also a rather unusual occurrence 
of world-class heading tonight. And then lastly, but by no means least, uh, we have these three basins uh, which host evaporite deposits. Uh, the Stafford salt field uh, was uh, productive until about the 1970s. The Worcestershire salt field likewise, um, and these have both now ceased production. But the Cheshire salt field is still of uh, considerable economic importance, both for mined rock salt, which we've put on the roads over here for de-icing, and also for brine production, which feeds the chemical industry um, in this area to the south of Liverpool. So that gives you a, a bit of an overview of the variety uh, and diversity of the mineral deposits of the area. We'll start in Derbyshire. Uh, this is a, an upland area uh, of uh, limestone moorland, uh, really quite scenic, flanked on either side by gritstone edges, which are popular for rock climbing. And it's known as the Southern Pennine Ore Field to distinguish it from the uh, perhaps better known Northern Pennine Ore Field. Uh, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the beautiful fluorite specimens that are, are produced in places like Weirdale and around Alston. Derbyshire uh, produced principally lead and zinc, uh, calcite as a decorative product, and fluor spar as a flux for the steel industry, barite as a, principally as a filler for drilling mud for oil and gas exploration. From a, min <coughs> excuse me, from a mineralogical point of view, phosgenite and matlachite are probably the two most famous uh, minerals from this area. And of course we have Blue John, the decorative variety of banded fluorite. So I'm going to start uh, in the area around Matlock Bath. This is a popular tourist destination, uh, a Victorian resort, uh, if you will. And you can see uh, these, uh, these grey crosses and circles. These are marking mineral localities. We don't have time to look at all of these today, but I'm just going to touch on a couple. Uh, Dimple Mine. Riber Mine, um, at Masson Hill, and, and we'll go over the top onto Bonsall Moor. So one of the things that Derbyshire is noted for is fine specimens of calcite. This is a particularly nice example from Dimple Mine. It's quite a large specimen at 18 centimetres. And these typical sort of smoky uh, scalenohedrons are very typical of, of Dimple Mine. A specimen I came across while I was working at the Latworth Museum, where I work as a volunteer, which is part of the University of Birmingham. I found this in a drawer without any other information, and I looked at it and it looked strangely familiar to me. And sadly, we don't have any curatorial records relating to this. We don't know whose number the 562 is or what it relates to. But upon thinking a little further, I remembered this illustration in Sowerby's British Mineralogy and he describes in some detail his curiosity about the fact that the cores of the crystals were etched and looked corroded and the later overgrowth was lustrous and transparent and attractive and he was obviously quite taken with this and although we don't have any definitive reason to confirm it I have a strong feeling that my specimen from the Latworth uh, is very likely from Dimple Mine. Coming a little bit further south, still on the east bank of the Derwent, um, Riber Mine was one of the later working mines in the area. Uh, it was exploited uh, as a sort of follow-on to Millclose Mine, which was coming to the end of its life. And so from the 1950s through to about the 1970s, uh, exploration and development was undertaken, but it was not really very much of an economic success. But you can see here we've got a nice phantom inside the calcite crystal. There's, a, there's an earlier crystal and a cloud of chalcopyrite. And uh, there's also some native copper inclusions. Now if we continue over the, the top of the hill uh, to the west of Matlock, we come to Bonsall Moor. And this is perhaps one of the most intensively worked areas of our region. You can see here a lot of shafts, uh, shallow depressions, bell pits. And you can almost join the dots to mark out the line of the structures, uh, the mineral veins or rakes as they're called in Derbyshire. And this is a really interesting area to walk across as a public footpath runs across the ground. And the density of the shafts here is perhaps the highest of any area in the Peak District. Bonsall Moor uh, produced uh, a small number, perhaps some tens of these unusual axe head twins, which are much sought after by British collectors. This is quite a nice example at about four centimetres tall. 
and is also thought to be the uh, locality for this stuff, Brainstone Bear Eye, which is a, a sort of collecting oddity which appears widely in early Victorian collections. So somebody found a heap of this stuff uh, and distributed it out through the dealer network and I've seen it in quite a number of old collections. And what we're looking at is uh, arborescent sprays of white barite crystals and the interstices of these filled in with a sort of limonitic mud. And it was thought to be sufficiently interesting uh, by Sowerby for him to include two plates of it in British Mineralogy Volume 5. Now here's a physical example of a, of a real piece. This has been sawn and uh, crudely polished and it, you can see these arborescent branching uh, white barite crystals and the brown infilling. This specimen is from the Royal Cornwall Museum in Truro. Now also uh, in the area around Bonson Moor in, in the village of Com Cromford, Beige Mine is perhaps the most famous locality in the Peak District, uh, certainly amongst mineral collectors. Uh, being the type locality for matlachite and phosgenite. And this is me back in about 1985 being winched down hard end shaft. It's about 300 feet deep. And uh, looking on behind is John Jones. Some of you may have met John. He's a very well known, uh, long standing British collector. This is looking directly down hard end shaft. Um, the upper few metres are lined with uh, dry stone walling. Uh, this is known as ginging in Derbyshire and it's there to protect the shaft collar from collapsing uh, of the superficial material. Once you get down into the, the depths uh, you're, you're in solid limestone and there's no need for uh, shaft lining. Now one of the things that uh, beige mine uh, is noted for obviously are phosgenite and malachite and this photo shows the late Mick Cooper on the right and I'm sure some of you will have known Mick he organised an appeal to raise funds to buy a number of specimens which Lindsay Greenbank had for sale back in the 1990s and they purchased a really nice phosgenite, a very fine matlachite, an anglesite, a couple of calcites and this is their little celebratory group once they had a, a completed the acquisition. This is one of the specimens they purchased so this is now in Derby, Derby Museum and Art Gallery and it's a beautiful little specimen. Uh, the tabular crystal here is about 25 millimeters an inch and the prismatic yellow crystal a little bit larger at 35 millimeters tall. And this came from the collection of the late Richard Barstow and he acquired it uh, from an old collection uh, possibly as a Russell duplicate and this was from the Bernkus assay office collection and you'll see a number of specimens attributed to the Bernkus assay office collection. It was part of the Williams family dynasty. The next specimen is a rather fine large um, waxy yellow plate of matlachite. Uh, so here we're looking at a sort of aggregate of tabular crystals in parallel growth and here you can just see the edge of, of one of the tabular crystals showing against the dark background. Another lovely specimen of phosgenite, uh, this one also from the Williams collection, the Bern Coos. Uh, this one originally provided by Bryce Wright with his original label here, now in the Russell collection at the Natural History Museum in London and uh, a very nice thing to acquire. And I've included Sir Arthur's label here just uh, for interest. Uh, you're probably familiar with his very characteristically neat handwriting. Another beautiful little phosgenite, um, glass clear, um, the crystal is about 20 millimetres long and uh, on a piece of slightly friable looking galena and sulphide matrix uh, with calcite and fluorite. And another really superb specimen, this one is noticeably heavy if you heft it in the hand and the pinacoid faces uh, that we're looking at are all in alignment and it all, it all winks at you if you if you tip it to and fro. Uh, a really lovely thing and uh, 35 millimeters across. And perhaps one of the finest specimens that I came across during the, the research phase of the project was this one. Uh, this was more or less rattling around in a drawer at the Cedric Museum, University of Cambridge. Really underappreciated and not recognized for its true 
of value. And uh, I, I went to see the curator and said, look, could we could we get a box with a lid on and some uh, plaster oak foam, please? And uh, the lady said to me, well, why? Was it important? I said, well, I think so. You could probably sell this for £10,000 tomorrow. So uh, I was duly provided with uh, a box and a lid and a scalpel, and it's now properly packaged and, and safeguarded. But it's a, it's a really wonderful specimen with these sort of flowers of uh, platy malachite and a really large, lustrous, blocky, transparent phosgenite. And it's interesting that this old label that accompanies the specimen mentions the fact that the cromphodite or phosgenite is an in situ crystal. And I think the relevance of that was that perhaps it was reasonably common for people to reattach crystals to pieces of matrix because the purchaser or collector would obviously rather have a matrix specimen. Now in this case, uh, this one is definitely a fake. And you can see here that we've got a large blocky matlachite crystal, a little bit worn and rubbed around the edges, but impressive nonetheless. And it's sitting in a bed of what looks like crushed galena. I would call this Moroccan galena. It's the sort of stuff you find stuck into geodes at the roadside in Morocco. But clearly, uh, whoever had the crystal thought they would get a better price for it on Matrix. And indeed, the Natural History Museum have it accessioned as two separate numbers, one for the crystal and one for the matrix. Next, I'd like to take a look at Millclose Mine. Millclose Mine was one of the largest and most important lead mines in the whole of the UK. Uh, it's situated in Darleydale, and there's relatively little to see now, but in its heyday, it was a really major employer. This rather splendid cross-section uh, shows the mine, uh, shows some of the shafts, uh, the levels, but most interestingly we, we can see here the structure of the vein and the fact that these sort of side shoots, uh, they're not really flats but they're akin to sort of flats. So these are caverns which have been infilled by mineralization with fluids sort of leaking from the main feed and these were dramatic. Uh, they were filled with very large crystals of, of fluorite and calcite and they presented something of a problem to the miners because you can imagine you could suddenly blast through into a void space and be looking down into a big hole that you weren't expecting to meet. So a rather interesting set of diagrams. Just like to show you a few specimens from Millclose Mine. Here's a particularly nice galena on pale yellow fluorite. This one in the Russell Collection. One from the Cedric Museum collection at the University of Cambridge. Uh, here we've got uh, colourless fluorite thickly laden with sulphide inclusions and the reverse of the specimen is uh, covered in fairly coarsely crystallised sphalerite. Here we've got a fossil, uh, Actinoceros, which has been uh, completely replaced by colourless crystalline fluorite and you can see some of the fluorite on the margin on the outside is, is a pale mauve colour. And perhaps the mineral that most people would associate with Millclose Mine are beautiful calcite crystals. And here's a very fine example from Sir Arthur's collection, um, 60 millimetres tall. And a typical Millclose or Derbyshire twin, you can see the re-entrant angle sort of notch here at the top, uh, again from Sir Arthur Russell's collection at the Natural History Museum in London. An unusual piece here, uh, this is a, a stalactite, so a, a calcite stalactite, which has been encrusted and overgrown by tombstone uh, crystals of white barite, uh, sort of in disarray, uh, almost as if uh, you'd had a water pipe leaking. And I, I presume it was hanging this way round rather than the other way, uh, but an uh, interesting and striking specimen, and there are a couple of these in the, in the Russell collection. And uh, finally, for Millclose Mine, uh, this is um, Ori Chalcite, zinc copper carbonate, uh, little rosettes of pretty pale bluish green tabular crystals. And Millclose produced quite a lot of this, and Sir Arthur Russell uh, acquired uh, quite a number of specimens. 
So moving slightly to the west and, and north a little, uh, we'll just stop by at this locality, Arbolo. Arbolo is known as an antiquity site, it's a, a rather fine stone circle. And in a field at the margin of the site uh, is the locality for this unusual variety of brown banded bear eye, known as oak stone. It's a popular lapidary and inlay work material and uh, some some tons of this have been produced over the years. Here's a typical sort of knick-knack uh, piece that would have been sold in a, in a tourist shop um, perhaps back in Victorian days and it's quite often for these to have polished curved surfaces and I've seen these referred to as rope polished and I presume the idea was that you simply had a piece of hemp rope with some abrasive and you rubbed it to and fro and therefore you got a curved groove and either concave or convex surfaces depending on how you applied it. And the pink card underneath is quite interesting. This is the other side of it and this is obviously a sort of point of sale leaflet to try and encourage the potential purchaser to actually part with his cash and it tells you all the important things you need to know, what it is, um, supplied under the patronage of the Grace of the Duke of Rutland, uh, they've had it analysed and you really need to buy one of these. And I've seen these in various colours. They were originally produced by a chap called John Balance. His business was acquired by Walker and when Walker folded his business um, it was acquired by John Higton and rather than have the card reprinted he obviously decided to use up the old stock and just had a, a rubber stamp made. Continuing our trip northwards um, we come to the, the village of Eam. Eam is perhaps well known um, for being the plague village uh, and the outbreak of bubonic plague which resulted in the village deciding to self-isolate something that we've all got used to with the Covid pandemic but uh, they showed great uh, presence of mind and self-sacrifice and a number of the villagers died but by doing that they managed to stop the infection spreading to adjacent villages and so uh, they managed to bring that outbreak to an end. But the reason for including it is that this specimen illustrated by Philip Rashley in his book Specimens of British Minerals Part 1 dating from 1797 is now actually in the collection of Sir Arthur Russell and this is Sir Arthur Russell's handwritten label providing all of the details. Uh, the next slide will show you the actual specimen. So here's the actual specimen. It's not quite uh, a photorealistic sort of representation, but I think you would rep uh, recognise the specimen from the picture and vice versa. Um, so rather rather nice to, to see the two things together. Now moving around uh, the, the area, we, we've got uh, Lady Wash Mine, it's perhaps one of the famous localities around Eam, noted particularly for lovely specimens of calcite. And this is a typical example uh, towards the larger end, uh, 110 millimetres tall, and a very nice thing to have. And if we continue northwards, we come up uh, onto the area where Dirtlow Rake has been worked. This was one of the really major structures across the Peak District ore field. And at an area around Hollentwine Mine, there was a particular abundance of these things and these are again as referred to as pseudostalactitic barite. You can see that there's a columnar structure that is banded at the sequential deposition and on the outside we've got a rather different growth style and sometimes these look like helixes or corkscrews uh, so really quite interesting and they were deposited and then the, the gaps infilled with a limestone sort of carbonate mud clay mixture which was quite amenable to being dissolved out uh, using hydrochloric acid and that's how this specimen would have been prepared. If we cut a transverse section this is what you see and it's right interesting to, to see what's going on here. You can see that the, the minerals have nucleated around a hollow core. Uh, whether this was a true stalactite or not I don't know. And there then was a period of rhythmic deposition uh, with white and pink stripes, uh, a very delicate structure. And then after a while uh, we got a, a strongly pink zone 
and then suddenly something changed with the solutions and we had coarse deposition of uh, colourless tabular barite on the outside. So uh, a bit of a Derbyshire speciality and, and rather nice rather nice specimens. And so at the top of Derbyshire, the northern end, uh, we come to Castleton and the Winnets Pass. In the far distance there we can see the upland of uh, Kinder Scout. Uh, the hill in the middle distance with the sun on it is Mam Tor. It's a, a very active landslip and the landslip has resulted in the closure of the road at its foot. But the reason for including the photo is that this little knoll here is Treat Cliff and this is the, the home of Blue John. And in the lower right here, just above the trees, uh, you can see the entrance to the show cave, which is Treat Cliff Cavern. And there is a whole tourist industry hanging on the fact that this banded purple fluorite occurs in this little, little hill. This is what Blue John <laughs> looks like. It's a very large specimen on open display in the mineral gallery at the Natural History Museum. Quite nice to, to be able to see that. And this has been fashioned into goblets and candlesticks and all sorts of decorative objects for hundreds of years and still is. So next we're going to go down into the southwest of our area to Gloucestershire and again uh, you'll see the symbols for, for the mineral localities that are mentioned in the book. Uh, I'm really only going to talk about the Celestine industry and Hampstead Farm quarry today uh, just simply due to lack of time. This is taken from one of the early geological survey memoirs and it shows the areas which have been worked for Celestine. Each little blue circle is a field uh, which has been excavated and Celestine extracted. And the chart here shows you the fortunes of the industry. Um, so starting from about the late 1800s uh, peaking around about 1900 at 30,000 tonnes of production in the year. Uh, production then fell away, it came to a, a grinding halt in the First World War because the major use was for with the refining of sugar beet in Germany. Uh, it then picked up again until the Second World War when again exports stopped and it then had a sort of faltering period of about 40 years or so before finally coming to an end in the late 1980s. It was a fairly crude sort of extraction process. Uh, the nodules uh, occurred at depths varying from a few feet down to about 30 feet. And so the extraction company would simply lease a field from the landowner, typically for a year, because that was long enough to strip the overburden, uh, extract the nodules and then reinstate the ground. And you can see here that some of these are quite sizable. Bear in mind that Celestine is quite a dense mineral comparable to barite and some of these things are the size of a small car. It was then taken to a crushing and screening plant before packing ready for export. Now if you mine 20 or 30,000 tonnes of, of, of those nodules in a year and break them up you're going to find some specimens and there are many nice specimens of Celestine from Yate. I'll just pick this one to illustrate uh, the sort of size that the crystals can attain. This is uh, 95 millimetres uh, so a really nice uh, classic sort of orthorhombic habit. And here's a, an example showing uh, the sort of orangey peach uh, coloured Celestine. Uh, this was known as coral to the quarrymen and the central core with a pale faintly blue um, colourless sort of uh, variant. The last mineral to be deposited in these nodules uh, was generally selenite or gypsum and as a result of that you can see crystals of celestine sometimes uh, encapsulated in the selenite which is quite nice, like they make for interesting specimens, very, very representative of, of the area, very recognisable. And before leaving Gloucestershire, I just wanted to mention Hampstead Farm Quarry. Uh, this is a quarry uh, in the village of Chipping Sodbury, not far from Yate. And it's known perhaps uh, for this pink striped material, uh, which is barium rich celestine, uh, sometimes described as barito celestine, but uh, the current trend seems to be in favour of barium rich celestine. And it's mixed in with various sulphides, 
And so typically we see pyrite and marcosite and sphalerite. And the, the later infilling, uh, this would have been a cave system uh, which has been infilled by mineralizing solutions. Quite often the final phase are large euhedral crystals of calcite, some of which can be spectacularly attractive. This is a, a great specimen. This is a, a boulder about a ton in weight. It's about a metre across. It's on display in the Natural History Museum in London. And I think it's a, a wonderful thing that you could sit a group of perhaps eight or ten year olds in front of and tell them a story about rivers forming cave systems in limestones and then mineral deposits being formed in the cave systems and then earthquakes and tectonics shattering the ground and pieces falling off and then more mineralization taking place. It's a, it's a sort of thing that could be uh, tremendously instructive in getting people interested in earth sciences and mineralogy. And just a couple of specimens. Here's a, a very nice large calcite, 18 centimeters tall. Um, this one belongs to Steve Birchmore, a friend of mine. And a very typical specimen showing the calcite as the last formed phase overgrowing the uh, bright brassy pyrite on the limestone. Another Steve Birchmore specimen. So next we'll we'll head up to the northeast and have a look at some of the quarries in Leicestershire. Leicestershire is uh, an area which is perhaps well known for its hard rock quarries above everything else, but there are interesting mineral deposits associated with those hard rocks and also one or two other interesting occurrences uh, which we don't really have time to address today, but I'll mention just in passing the Earl Ferris lead mines which produced beautiful specimens of uh, simple sulphides of calcite, uh, which are highly characteristic and much sought after. So here is one of the large holes in the ground. Uh, this is Croft Quarry. I first visited Croft Quarry probably in about 1980. And since that time, um, at that time the ground level was about here. Uh, extraction has powered on and the bottom of the quarry is now well below sea level. Uh, it's about 230 metres deep, so 760 feet, and from where I'm standing to where the plant is is about a kilometre, and uh, we're looking roughly south. In the 1980s, uh, it was a pr uh, very productive of zeolites, um, uh, particularly analcyme so associated with calcite, and they came from this sort of horizon here. Sadly, over the years, uh, access has become more difficult, and we've not had any trips into here for probably 20 years. But looking at it through binoculars, this looks like very solid, massive gramadiorite. It doesn't look like there are any cavities or any mineralization. Here's a typical specimen, uh, and the reason that Croft and Alcim is popular. So lustrous um, icosi tetrahedral crystals, and they're sort of dripping down the face of this calcite, a bit like treacle. Uh, the orange coloration is very thin. It's due to a, a little coating of iron oxide. Many of the calcite crystals at Croft are oddly distorted and many of them actually look pseudo-cubic and you can see here you might be forgiven for thinking that was a cube face and this was a cube face and there's a straight edge at the back but they obviously are standard calcite crystals just a, an odd distortion. And then uh, the zeolite uh, and alcim has been deposited over the top. Sometimes uh, we also see lormontite. Lormontite may alter to leonhardite, and also we see replacements. So here we have a pseudomorphous replacement of calcite and analcime, totally replacing a divergent spray of what was presumably lormontite originally. Another quarry that's been uh, very interesting from time to time is New Cliff Hill Quarry. Uh, this was actually a brand new quarry uh, started. Uh, for perhaps 20 years ago and the uh, the thing to, to look at in this photo is really the buried topography so you can see here the the basement rocks and then above it the Triassic infill and so this would have been a hill here we have a river valley or a wadi and the interest for us mineralogically generally is along this unconformity and at the bottom of structures like this you can get ponding of mineralizing solutions and indeed Newcliff Hill produced some astonishingly rich and fine specimens of native copper and cuprite. 
This is a photo showing that contact uh, with the uh, unconformable trias uh, sitting on the older basement rocks and you can I'm sure see the blue and green staining indicating copper mineralization. Here's a specimen. Uh, this is uh, a beautiful specimen and really shows the potential of the material. So we're looking here at a, a massive lump of reddish cuprite. Um, in the cavities you can see lustrous dark red cuprite crystals. The bits that are sticking out on the edges are hackly masses of copper, native copper. And then in the cavities in the cuprite we've got all manner of super gene minerals. Uh, here you can see quite clearly malachite and azurite but there are a whole range of other much more exotic spe species as well. Some of the patches of native copper were spectacularly large. This is uh, almost a metre long, 76 centimetres, it's about two centimetres thick and it's a noticeably heavy piece of metal. Again this is from Steve Birchmore's collection. And just to show you a few of the, the micros that occur in the cuprite and native copper, here is a lovely specimen of azurite. The crystal is about five millimeters from tip to end. A photo by David Green. Uh, here we have uh, chalcophyllite, copper arsenate. Uh, these are very small specimens. Um, these crystals are about um, a millimeter across, perhaps. Another David Green photo. And a starburst of lovely blue conolite blades or needles, um, again very small, 1.25 millimetres across, expertly captured by David. And perhaps the, the thing that's most uh, most pleasing are uh, the lovely shapes of the dark red cuprite crystals. So from Leicestershire we'll go to Nottinghamshire and I just wanted to include Nottinghamshire briefly because it's one of the areas that still has an active mining industry. Uh, so Nottingham's down in the south here uh, and then there's a, a run of mineralisation running up here and you can see running up here and it also goes down into, into Leicestershire. But we have both underground mines and open cost workings. And this is what a large uh, open cast gypsum mine looks like. Uh, you can see that there's a whole host of horizons of gypsum and the economics dictate that it's actually worth taking all of that overburden off and then taking the gypsum out wholesale and separating it. And it's more productive and economically effective to do that than it would be to try and mine those thin seams by underground mining. By contrast, uh, the Marblagius mine at East Leak has gone for pillar and stall working and the seams that they're working are viable to operate uh, by underground pillar and store mining. You don't have to go underground to see this mineralisation. Uh, these are veins of gypsum, uh, variety satin spar at Gunthorpe Weir on the bank of the River Trent. Uh, this is quite a good place to go and see uh, exposures and also uh, to collect some representative material. Here you can see a typical piece of uh, columnar gypsum variety satin spa from Gunthorpe Weir. So next we're going to go down to the south of the area to Oxfordshire and Oxford uh, is not noted as a mineralogical sort of high spot but the reason for including it is a locality known as Shotover Hill which was featured by James Sowerby in his British Mineralogy. Here's the plate from British Mineralogy Volume 1 and I just love the detail here, that first of all the geometrical accuracy and the faithful representation of what gypsum crystals look like, but also he's even captured the interference fringes that occur due to the delamination of the, uh, the cleavage inside the crystals, uh, very typical of specimens um, of gypsum. The localities from where the specimens were collected were the brickyards or brick pits, and you can see in this old photo some of the nodules of, of, of concretions and the selenite crystals would have been growing in the clay. Uh, the circumstances surrounding why we have particularly large gypsum crystals there are a bit of a mystery but there's no doubt that, uh, that they occurred in some abundance. Here's a, a magnificent specimen so this is 17 centimeters uh, across 
and given the size of the specimen and the softness of the material I think it survived remarkably well and this one is in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History uh, where they have a very fine suite of these. Sometimes uh, you get uh, clear zonation uh, so the, the early part of the crystal here has obviously included quite a lot of clay particles and then later on it got its act together and we're starting to see uh, ice clear gypsum in the outer portions and this in fact is a, is a cleaved crystal uh, in two parts. Now uh, you can still collect um, selenite uh, in Oxfordshire you really just need to wait for someone to dig into the right clay horizon and then go and have a look and this is a rather nice one uh, again note the, um, the colour fringes here uh, just as picked out and depicted by Sowerby. This one uh, came from the Wendelby Borrow Pit when the M40 motorway was being constructed. So it's still worth keeping an eye out for excavations and building sites just to see what turns up. We'll head over to the west now to Shropshire um, and we're going to talk about two particular features here. Uh, firstly the, the West Shropshire mining field and we'll have a look at Snail Beach Mine and then we'll have a, a quick look at Squilver Quarry which is down in the in the south of the area here uh, which was uh, a chance encounter a result of a petrology paper that I looked at which led us to go and have a look at the quarry and it turned out to produce some very interesting material. So first of all uh, this is the the area of where the, the big lead mines were a uh, number of mines so Snail Beach mine up in the north uh, the Stiperstones Ridge of, uh, of Quartzite and then a number of smaller smaller workings down here all associated with the village of Shell. This is a wonderful old photograph uh, taken in about 1895 on a plate camera so large format plenty of resolution you can really zoom in on the original TIFF file of this scan uh, but you can see that this was a fully integrated site uh, it had its own railway uh, number of shafts compressor house miners dry blacksmith shop and a very large spoil heap of, of white crushed calcite which was a famous landmark for for many years This was the site uh, round about the time that I first visited it in 1980. Uh, this is the Halbers Company engine house, that was a, a reprocessing plant, they, they reworked the dumps for the mineral content and the aerial view or the view from the hill uh, was taken from up here and the other buildings are in the trees up here. Uh, it's now in the care of the Shropshire Mines Trust and it's a really interesting place to go and have a wander down, a wander around uh, and you can also take an underground trip on certain days of the year. This is all that's left uh, sadly of the spoil heaps it was decided they were a health hazard with airborne lead dust uh, risk to children and so most of it was carted away uh, some of it was tipped into stopes and it's now all been vegetated so there's very little to see in terms of mineralogical material other than one designated area which is really not very exciting. The area was particularly noted for sort of mauve to pale pink calcites, uh, some of them very large. Uh, this is a spectacularly large specimen which is kept in the basement at Ludlow Museum. It's over a metre long and again given its size and weight it's been looked after uh, remarkably well. But a more manageable piece, uh, we've got a suite of about a dozen really nice specimens at the, Lad at the Latworth Museum and these are all from the Robert Jasper Moore collection he was a local MP and this is absolutely typical the pale pink calcite uh, coarse bright galena and a final dusting of pyramidal colourless quartz they really are very pleasing specimens and very uh, distinctive here's another one just looks like someone's been around the edge with an icing bag just putting the quartz on uh, I would really like to have one of these in my collection. But the mine also produced uh, other interesting things. Harmatone was an oddity and some really unusual calcites. So here we've got some sort of twin and then a later overgrowth of elongate crystals and some small spiky ones. And again this specimen uh, this is from Sir Arthur Russell's collection. Uh, again Russell's distinctive writing here and he acquired it from the mine captain 
Captain W. Oldfield, who was evidently reasonably supportive of mineralogists and geologists and was interested in what they were interested in, in finding. Now I mentioned School of the Quarry. Uh, this was a complete chance find. We first went there looking for prenite because I had found uh, a mention in a petrographic paper of little thin veins of prenite in a thin section and I wondered whether there were any big veins of prenite, which it turned out that there are. And subsequently this mineral came to light and they are amongst the best specimens of Eddingtonite in the world. Um, some of them are quite blocky uh, and colourless, others are larger and sort of tabular uh, and milky, but they're, they're all of great interest and a complete surprise in Shropshire. This is one of the large flattened crystals, so you can see this, this sort of mitred corner which is quite characteristic of the crystal form. So we'll head north now from Shropshire, uh, heading up the so Shropshire was down here, we're heading up the motorway and across to the Etchen Copper Mines, which are adjacent to the Peak District, but separate uh, from a genetic and geological point of view. This is the Manifold Valley, uh, looking at Acton Hill, uh, really lovely tourist country to go just walking, cycling or whatever. Uh, in the trees down here there are various buildings, you can see some spoil heaps, there are adits driven into the hillside, another one here, and a shaft here. And Acton worked some vertical structures known as pipes, uh, they were enormously rich for a period of time, and the mines were owned by the Dukes of Devonshire, and they generated a lot of money over an extended period of time. But from a mineralogical point of view, they're noted really for large calcite crystals and coarse chalcopyrite and unusual nodular barite. Here's a typical specimen uh, of chalcopyrite crystals overgrowing uh, balls of barite. Uh, if you see these, they're very, very distinctive uh, and recognisable as being from Acton. The calcites uh, sometimes can be rather sort of etched and, uh, and corroded, but again uh, richly included by and overgrown by coarse chalcopyrite, very rich ore. This is perhaps one of the nicest that I've seen. This belongs to a friend of mine, John Cook. Uh, it's from the collection of Robert Ferguson of Wraith, and it was uh, acquired by Brian Lloyd when he dispersed the collection. Uh, this one ended up in the States and John was able to repatriate it from an American dealer. Uh, so it's a, it's a really historic specimen and it's, it's very, very large. It's 430 millimetres tall, so uh, it's a very impressive specimen in the flesh. Something else that's uh, quite distinctive about Ecton, uh, you see these little balls of barite uh, scattered with chalcopyrite on the top and then sometimes this sort of greenish material which I assume is malachite, uh, although the colour doesn't really look quite right. Uh, probably we ought to get this checked one of these days. And something else that was a bit of an oddity that appealed to me, uh, some years ago there used to be a, a spoil heap at the entrance to the Ecton Deep Adit, and this material was not difficult to find uh, on the spoil heap. They're uh, like ta little tadpoles queuing up at the edge of an aquarium tank trying to escape. So finally I'd just like to say a few words about decorative stones. The, the area has produced quite a wide range of decorative stones uh, and this is a portion of an Ashford black marble tabletop. Uh, these things were manufactured and much in demand. Um, so the, the black marble is in fact a bituminous limestone and the inlay work here is a mixture of other limestones, pink barite, brown barite, we saw oak stone earlier, there's a little veinlet of galena there. We've got some blue John Fleur spar, fossil corals, crinoids. So anything that they could lay their hands on that would take a polish. So it's a bit like a, a geological trip across the Peak District. One of the other mineral productions uh, was alabaster. This is a compact translucent form of gypsum. And this was uh, used for interior decoration, for things like tombs and monuments in churches. Uh, it doesn't weather particularly well, but in the indoor environment it, it, it stands up very well. 
and it's easy to carve and it takes a nice polish and these fine columns are in the Great Hall at uh, Kettleston which is a National Trust property. One of the largest items uh, manufactured in uh, Derbyshire Alabaster is um, in fact this one is not from Derbyshire this is from Fold in Staffordshire of course uh, this is a large Tazza in the Geological Museum and this was presented by the Duke of Devonshire to the Museum of Practical Geology in 1851 and you can see that it's, it's quite sizable 1.8 meters by 2.5 this is the table that we that we saw the segment of to start with uh, in its uh, in glory uh, and you can see it's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship most of the material around the outside is locally derived uh, I would think most of the material in the middle is, is foreign. We, we don't expect to see malachite of that sort of quality, nor I don't know what the blue mineral is uh, in Derbyshire, but a very fine, very fine piece of work. If you'd like to see more black marble, uh, there's a very good collection at Buxton Museum. They've got a nice new gallery. This is the black marble case. And you can see the range of ornaments. Typically, there were obelisks, thermometers, paperweights, inkstands, little goblets and bowls, pen trays, uh, and, and the tables would have been at the at the upper end of the of the budget range. And then finally, I thought I should mention Blue John. Uh, Blue John is the banded uh, white and yellow and purple variety of fluorite. Uh, we saw that at Treat Cliff earlier on in the talk. And if you'd like to know more about Blue John, I can recommend this little book was produced by Trevor Ford, uh, sadly no longer with us, uh, but it has been recently um, updated by Noel Worley and Tony Waltham, and they've done a great job, all new photography, all in colour, uh, and it's a really, really good thing to have if you're interested in Blue John. Now, these were the lots in a sort of composite auction sale that was assembled by Fellows in Birmingham in October 2015. And I think it really fits the bill of something for everybody, all budgets. The things at the bottom here were, were relatively inexpensive, and the most expensive item at the back here was about £20,000, and everything in between. I mentioned Buxton Museum. Uh, this is the uh, window that they had commissioned for the opening of their new Wonders of the Peak Gallery. So the design was done by local school children. The work was executed by uh, local craftsmen and it's nice to see the idea of keeping a Blue John window alive. Uh, there's, there's a very famous one inside Chatsworth House. So I hope that that's uh, been of interest and given you some idea of the diversity of the mineral deposits and mineral specimens of the Midlands. Uh, there are many other aspects to the story, lots of interesting people and places. Obviously we don't have time to do justice to all of that in a talk this morning. But uh, if you'll forgive me, um, I'll happily give a plug for the book. Um, this was produced as a, as a project. Um, the copies are still available. The softback version is £35. So in US terms, about $80 delivered, including the shipping. You can order it online uh, from my website. Um, very happy to ship bulk quantities to resellers. And uh, Gloria Stabler of Lithography will be restocking shortly. So if it's easier for you to get from her then please do. And finally, I mentioned Sir Arthur Russell uh, a couple of times through the talk. I'm just uh, awaiting uh, this to come back from the printers. The typesetting and the layout is all completed. Uh, this is a really major uh, work. Uh, it looks at the, the history of the Russell family uh, through uh, Arthur's long life and is illustrated with about 750 photos of which about 455 are specially taken images of uh, specimens from his collection and I've done these all as hardbacks uh, it's the same size and weight as the Midlands of the Minerals uh, Minerals of the Midlands and uh, this one's going to be £40 plus shipping so probably about $100 US delivered and again uh, Gloria said she will take some of these so you can either order directly from me or from Gloria if that's more convenient so thank you for listening. Uh, I think we're about on time and I'll leave it there.